government of Saskatchewan introduced the first universal hospital insurance in North America. A good number of the doctors were, uh, were running harassing tactics. This will not disappear or be frittered away by any provincial government. It has to be all-inclusive and it covers all the people of Saskatchewan. Healthcare still lies at the base of human happiness. Something happened in Saskatchewan 50 years ago that changed the mindset of Canadians when it comes to their health care. Medicare was a plan that would provide health services to Saskatchewan families regardless of ability to pay. It would eventually spread across Canada. A bustling Saskatchewan hospital providing state-of-the-art modern health care at no direct cost to the patient. For many residents of Saskatchewan, this is the norm. We expect and demand a government-funded health care system. But it wasn't always that way. Saskatchewan is the birthplace of Medicare in North America. But getting publicly funded health care wasn't easy. The government of the day had a fight on its hands, even after it was implemented. To understand that battle and how Medicare evolved over the years, it's important to look at what led to its introduction and the vision of the man who was the driving force of bringing Medicare to Saskatchewan. The speaker at this time will be T.C. Douglas, leader of the Saskatchewan CCF. The ultimate test of any society is what it does to human beings. The CCF planned to build a cooperative commonwealth. The election of T.C. Douglas and the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, or CCF, in 1944 would change Saskatchewan forever. Tommy Douglas would lead the way in North America for social reform that would eventually be followed by other governments. But what was most memorable? The thing that stands out in my mind is that uh, on January the 1st, 1947, uh, the government of Saskatchewan introduced the first universal hospital insurance in North America. The Hospital Insurance Act of 1947 guaranteed every citizen of the province hospital care without a fee. Twelve years later, in 1959, the government of Tommy Douglas announced a Medicare plan for Saskatchewan, a plan that would provide universal prepaid, publicly administered health care to all residents of the province. In his book, An Honourable Calling, Political Memoirs, former Premier Alan Blakeney credits the federal progressive conservative government of John Diefenbaker with allowing the Saskatchewan government to proceed with its groundbreaking plan when it did. Blakeney wrote, In June 1958, the Diefenbaker government passed legislation to allow the federal government to pay half the cost of hospital care insurance. Douglas saw that by 1959, large sums of money would be coming to Saskatchewan to help pay for hospital costs. He and his cabinet colleagues decided to act. In 1961, the Douglas government introduced the Saskatchewan Medical Care Insurance Act, much to the displeasure of many of the province's doctors, including the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Despite the objections, the legislature passed the bill in November of that year. Within days, Tommy Douglas resigned as Premier to take on a new job as leader of the newly formed New Democratic Party in Ottawa. That left the implementation of Medicare to the new Premier of Saskatchewan, Woodrow Lloyd. As it turns out, his task was daunting. The doctors' revolt was growing. Their main concerns, a loss of professional independence and possible political interference. You see, the great majority of the residents of Saskatchewan who are judged to be able to pay for their own insurance premiums should continue to do so. But despite pressure to rescind the bill, the government wasn't about to back down. We are not, of course, willing to move from the fundamental basis of the plan, that is that it has to be all-inclusive, that it covers all the people of Saskatchewan, and that it has to be paid for by all the people of Saskatchewan. The lines of division were drawn as Medicare was about to be implemented in Saskatchewan. When we come back, the doctors take action and Saskatchewan is thrown into the international spotlight. The implementation of Medicare on July 1st, 1962 was a landmark day in Saskatchewan, but there was little to celebrate. The doctors would not back down and the people of Saskatchewan were worried. 
Most of the province's doctors immediately went on strike. They closed their offices in protest, causing chaos for their patients and the government. A compromise was offered to the doctors, but they were adamant the government should back down completely. Both sides dug in their heels. Those doctors who didn't want to strike set up community clinics, considered safe places to see their patients. Dr. Orville Jurdis was instrumental in setting up the first community clinic in Prince Albert, recruiting doctors from outside the province. This is the Avenue building in downtown Saskatoon. It was the first location of the Saskatoon Community Clinic in 1962. Then Betsy Naylor worked for the government. She played an important role in those early days of the community clinic. The doctors decided that they didn't like what we were doing and they were going to stop giving service. So that the, the seriousness of it became very evident. So a group of citizens organized uh, the community clinic uh, called the Community Health Services Association where we would try to get services both from physicians that were friendly to the Medicare plan and other health professionals. And so we had Dr. Margaret Mohood who was a psychiatrist in the mental health hospital in uh, uh, North Battleford. She came to us as a volunteer and so did Joan Whitney Moore came out of retirement. We found this building uh, available to us because the co-op college had moved and they let us have the room where they were in the avenue building. Dr. Sam Landa played an important role during the doctor's strike. When many of his colleagues walked off the job, he made sure there were doctors to handle emergency cases. I am being pressured uh, continuously by doctors who are telling me that if this emergency service goes on longer than a few days, that they will draw their, their uh, volunteer services and now be faced with an even worse shortage of medical personnel. Nurses had also yes, taken sides in the dispute. Zenny Burton supported so, Medicare. Uh, it was a, an interesting experience because um, many of the nurses there were not in favor of Medicare and I found it difficult at times when I would go down to the lunchroom for a meal and I would wonder if everybody would get up from the table that I would be sitting at or if they wouldn't, would not want me to sit with them. It was a, a difficult time. As the strike continued, residents became more agitated. The pressure was on both sides. The dispute was attracting international attention. Yeah. Keep Our Doctors committees were formed across the province and on July 11, 1962, a mass rally in support of doctors was held at the Legislative Building in Regina. More than 30,000 people were expected at the rally, but only a fraction of that showed up. This was considered a turning point in the dispute. It was proving to be a losing battle for the doctors. Well, John Burton uh, worked for Woodrow but, Lloyd. Uh, in spite of that, uh, then there were some other people who were in favor of Medicare. They wanted to hold their rally in Regina and, and uh, show that there were a lot of people in favor of the introduction of Medicare. And uh, the government held off and, uh, and said, no, no, don't come in now. And uh, Woodrow Lloyd said to me when we were traveling together on one occasion, if there had been a pro-Medicare rally in Regina at that time, there would have been a blood on the streets of Regina. The next week, Premier Lloyd invited Stephen Lord Taylor, a British physician, to be a special advisor to the government. He took the bull by the horns, shuttling back and forth between the Besborough Hotel in Saskatoon, where government officials were meeting, and the Medical Arts Building down the street, where officials with the College of Physicians and Surgeons were headquartered. Minor changes were made to the legislation, and on July 23, 1962, what was known as the Saskatoon Agreement was signed. The doctor's strike came to an end. But even after the strike was over, there were problems. For doctors who worked in community clinics, there were consequences. Zenny Burton. Our doctors were at the community clinic, but the community clinic doctors were not allowed hospital privileges. So, therefore, those of us who decided, had our babies at home. Others had to go to places like Winnipeg, or if they were with doctors who had hospital privileges, then they could go to the General or the Pasqua. 
and so our eldest son was born at home. Alan Blakeney was provincial treasurer when Medicare was implemented and within months was appointed health minister. Oh, there were many, many challenges because uh, a good number of the doctors were, uh, were running harassing tactics. Uh, uh, for a long time, they would not send in their bills on forms which would be, could be used by our computer. There were lots of problems, but uh, as time went on and as it was clear that the public were accepting Medicare and thinking it was a good idea, opposition uh, uh, settled down, it, it died away, both in the medical profession and in the political arena. Medicare was now a part of Saskatchewan and proved to be attractive to foreign doctors. John Berry was a respected physician in England in the early 60s. I came in 1963 because I was attracted to the idea of the community clinic. A friend of mine and, who had met in the army had been working in the health service for eight to ten years, which we enjoyed, but it wasn't sensitive enough to what patients really needed. And the idea of a clinic that was owned by the patients really attracted us. And that's why we came. It was the idea that a patient-owned clinic which worked as a team with the, with the providers of health care and that we would have a team of health care professionals in a system that was, in fact, prepaid medical insurance. Oh, and remember Betsy Naylor, who helped set up the community clinic in Saskatoon? Her name is now Betsy Berry. John and Betsy met through the community clinic in 1963 and eventually got married. A romance that wouldn't have happened without Medicare in Saskatchewan. The rest of the country watched Saskatchewan's experiment with Medicare closely. In 1964, Supreme Court Justice Emmett Hall, who spent much of his life in Saskatchewan, presented Ottawa with a report of his Royal Commission on Health Care. As a nation, we now take the necessary legislative, organization and financial decisions to make all the fruits of the health sciences available to all our residents without hindrance of any kind. The report proposed a publicly financed and administered health plan similar to the one in Saskatchewan. By the early 70s, Medicare was adopted across Canada. Emmett Hall became known as the father of Medicare, although in his latter years he mused about how Tommy Douglas once proposed they share the honour. And that was that, uh, <clears throat> that I should be known as the father-in-law of Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> and he would be the step the stepfather. <laughs> Fifteen years after Medicare was established, Emmett Hall re-examined the system and found it basically sound. But Medicare would continue to have challenges and be challenged. When we come back, the struggles that followed and the future of Medicare in Canada. The concept of Medicare in Canada faced many bumps and bruises in the years that followed its inception in Saskatchewan. As the public's demand on the health care system increased and governments changed, there would be severe strains on the system. By the late 1970s, universal Medicare was thoroughly entrenched in the Canadian psyche, but was undeniably showing signs of strain. Costs of health care were rising much faster than governments were willing to pay for them. Still, Pierre Trudeau pledged his commitment as Prime Minister. To make sure that this basic service, which is offered to Canadians now under the system which is recognized as probably the best in the world, that this will not disappear or be frittered away by any provincial governments. This is absolutely basic. Easier said than done, as more doctors across the country were asking their patients to pay extra every time they had a checkup. It was known as extra billing. The pressure was on the Liberal government in the early 1980s. Alberta has passed legislation legitimizing extra billing. BC is going heavy into balanced billing as of April the 1st. But the health minister, Monique Bejean, was not yet ready to withdraw federal money from provinces that didn't abide by the principles of Medicare. What can the Minister of Health of Saskatchewan, who is faced with, if I remember well, over $2 million extra billing, can do to ban extra billing if he loses all his doctors and specialists to the neighbour province that does not want to ban extra billing? That is the problem. The next year, in 1984, the Canada Health Act was adopted, specifying how the provincial health programs must conform in order to receive federal transfer payments. The criteria required universal coverage of insured procedures without extra billing. 
The Canada Health Act ensured a relatively consistent level of coverage across the country. On the 30th anniversary of Medicare in 1992, Canada's health care system was going through what some referred to as economic stress. Orville Jurdis. We must learn to do things more economically. We must, I think, try to find ways and means of cutting out any abuse that's there. But the principle of Medicare we must not lose. It's the, it is the thing that makes us all Canadians. Views on how to preserve Medicare have varied, some advocating a two-tiered system. What that does is obviously gives the wealthier people quicker care. But... It also gives the poorer people quicker care because it decompresses the other system. So it shortens the waiting time. So we got two tiers, but both tiers are better than the single tier. In 1995, some of the leaders of the Medicare battle of 1962 reunited to air their concerns about a federal government decision to give provinces a lump sum transfer payment, not necessarily for funding health care. People can't lead, live decently unless they are protected from illness and from the threat of poverty, especially in old age, especially for children, especially for women. In 2000, then Premier Roy Romano announced a long-awaited review of health care in Saskatchewan to be headed by former Deputy Health Minister Ken Fike. The next year, the Fike Report called for sweeping changes in the way health care is delivered, reducing the number of health districts, closing 50 rural hospitals, with acute care centralized at a dozen regional centres. And what is important here is not the time from the uh, from the accident to the hospital, what is important is that the emergency medical technician knows what to do when he hits the site of the accident. Later that year, the NDP government of Lorne Calvert announced a consolidation of health districts, but refused to implement the key recommendation of the Fight Commission. Rural hospitals were spared. Another report on the future of health care would be released the next year. This one requested by the federal Liberal government. The commissioner, a former Saskatchewan Premier. We'll talk to Roy Romano when we come back. In 2001, former Premier Roy Romano was asked by the federal government to prepare a report on the future of Medicare in Canada. Good morning, everybody. On November 28, 2002, Roy Romano released his final report. There were 47 recommendations, including a $15 billion targeted cash injection by Ottawa. It's been 10 years since you released your report. Do you still believe a lack of federal funding is the answer to Medicare? No. Um, Essentially, the shortfall in funding from Ottawa to the provinces was the pattern, the result of the pattern over 10, 15 years, which previous federal governments had enacted. The traditional deal on Medicare is 50%, 50 cents from Ottawa, 50 cents from the provinces, on the condition that it's a publicly funded health care system. That's what Mr. Pearson introduced. But over the years, it fell from 50 cents to roughly, I'm going now out of my memory and generalizing, 37 cents roughly was the Ottawa portion. So what my commission recommended was that we restore to the original deal, 50 cents from Ottawa, which would mean a big injection of cash, but, and that's a very important but, but the money was to be conditioned by reforms to the healthcare system, namely installation of home care, long-term care, uh, getting integrated practices, uh, more electronic health, uh, revising and modernizing in a number of ways, the 47 recommendations. Are, are you happy with the way governments have responded to your report? <laughs> I don't think there's any former Royal Commissioner who's really happy about the way governments respond to any Royal Commission report, but uh, with that caveat, I would say generally, no, I'm not, because uh, we had a wonderful opportunity in 2004 to the credit of Prime Minister Martin, the 50 cents was restored, so the original Medicare pact was made. But where the governments fell short, all of them, federal, provincial, is the money wasn't made conditional upon revising and modernizing the health care plan uh, in, to keep in, in, in tune with the times. 
Uh, that's where the shortfall took place. In 2002, Stephen Harper uh, was opposition leader at the time, as you yes. know. Uh, he had some uh, critical words for your report. And, and, and let me just quote here, time warped ideology, ideology that is completely that is out of touch with the, pro with the challenges the province has faced. There are harsh words from a, a, a person who is now Prime Minister of Canada. Yes, but I think one must ask, uh, since 2002, uh, how has he changed the fundamental plan? And essentially, he has not attacked it. I think there is one worrisome development which might uh, make the words of 2002 um, meaningful. And that is that he has reduced the federal funding again, now putting the onus is back on Saskatchewan and the provinces to make up the difference. And so the premiers are scrambling again to try to revise the scheme in order to make sure that it's covered by the appropriate funds or look at different means of funding. But all that I can say is two things. Number one, Mr. Harper, since his time as Prime Minister, has done nothing to essentially attack the concept of Medicare with one big caveat, and that is the arbitrary decision to give less money and not attach any conditions to the provinces. We're basically on their own now in the current set of supposed reforms and renovations that all of them are attempting. Let's look into the crystal ball. What will Medicare look like in 50 years, in, in your view? Well, first of all, I think that Medicare as a principle, which is based on the notion that it is a social good. It doesn't matter how rich we are, how poor we are, what our ethnic background, what, whatever our backgrounds are, we know that we are born, we live, we'll get sick, and we'll die. So we're all into this enterprise together, and I think that value will maintain itself, and I think it will be structured on that basis. And that's an underlying concept that Douglas and everybody else set up here at Royal University Hospital in throughout Saskatchewan and throughout Canada. That won't change. Now, as to how you deliver it will change a lot, because there's an explosion of new technology, an explosion of new medicines, which are in play. Who knows what the age of genetics will produce 15, 20, 25 years from now? All of that will change. But I think that Canadians will still insist that in the delivery of health care, it will be based on the principle that in this short journey through life, we're all in this together, and it should not depend upon the size of our wallets and our, and our pockets, but on the needs that we have. From its rocky beginning on July 1st, 1962 in Saskatchewan, to its current state 50 years later, it's inevitable our Medicare system will continue to evolve. But its survival will depend on a commitment from governments and ultimately from the people of Saskatchewan and the rest of Canada. Health care still lies at the base of human happiness. No guarantee that because people are healthy they'll be happy. But it's reasonable to assume that people who are unhealthy find it much more difficult to be happy.